Welcome to a special episode of the Programmatic Digest podcast where I'll be covering made for arbitrage, made for advertising. It's probably a topic you haven't heard a lot of recently, isn't it? <laughs> so we're going to talk about MFAs, but I'm really going to focus around analytics reports that came out in the last quarter. So both of the reports, the very first one talking about Amazon and a lot more, um, and also highlighting frequency limitations and then the most recent one about Forbes and site spoofing and how to address it I want you to know that if it is confusing right now um, my intention for this podcast is very much demystifying and to break it down so I am going to re redefine in a language that a five-year-old will be able to understand. And I do that with the utmost honor and respect because I want you to know, sometimes in our industry, we throw new acronyms out there in these streets and we repurpose others and we use them interchangeably but how can we move forward towards a unified solution if we don't even understand what that means for us and we don't even know how things are or um i'm gonna say how things are ex executed so um let's get into it mfas uh, we're going to talk about MFAs, how to determine MFAs, why now. Uh, we're going to talk about the origin story. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time in uh, analytics first report, a little bit of time on an analytics second report. We're going to talk about how do we stand as a buyer and uh, where do we stand as a buyer? And then what is the industry talking about? Um and also, I think it's very important to mention the reference or to bring it in for my traders and my buyers out here to really understand how does that affect your day to day and how a cookie how that that affects how to look at cookie less or how to look at programmatic curation or how to look at AI. So I'm gonna I'm kind of gonna bring it all into into one here. Okay. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so I won't spend a lot of time defining MFAs. I have realized that there's a lot of definition out there. And so I came across, uh, so I kind of combine everything into this particular one. MFA sites use sensational headlines and provocative content to attract visitors and generate ad revenue. Fundamentally, that's what it is. These sites often have low quality content and employ tactics like pop-ups, ads, or autoplay videos to maximize ad revenue. MFA sites have a higher carbon emission compared to a non-MFA sites due to the large number of ads per pages um, and indiscriminate ad calls. While MFA sites, while MFA sites may appear attractive to digital advertising buyers with high measurability rates and low level of invalid traffic, they typically perform poorly on key metrics like brand lift and driving sales. And so that is a definition that I had to write it down because it was <laughs> it was so much going on, y'all. So, um, and a lot of that is pulled also from Christoph. Christoph's at analytics uh, report. Okay. And so I feel like if once you understand that an MFA isn't supposedly, is supposedly not a site that you want your brand to target. Here's, here's one, one point. The second point is that we st are still operating as a trader based on that KPI. Okay. And so the short, the, the long answer to all everything I'm going to talk about, if I had to recap our conversation, is that, yes, we have to understand what MFAs is. We have to understand that they're not made for advertising. They're made for ad arbitrage. I like that definition better. And also, we have to understand that as long as we focus on KPIs, which is how we operate as trader, we are able to hopefully remove some of those MFAs. Because manually, visually, we can't really see. We can't really see it. We can't, we don't know that it's MFA. All right. So how do we determine that a site is MFA? <laughs> the short answer is honestly, as a trader, and this is a perspective from a programmatic media trader, 
uh, programmatic media, media buyer. So if you're on the sell side, if you're on the ad tech, I suggest you stick around because I'm going to make give you a view in how we as traders make decisions when it comes to how we optimize our, our supply. Uh, a supply that includes a site, a site list, um, SSPs, a list of SSPs, but also the list of sellers. And so I'll break it down to you. I won't go too much into, into details, into the step to step, but you'll understand why at the end of the day, we make certain decisions. Okay. And so the, the way we, we can help detect some of these MFAs, um, MFA site is that you have to understand what it looks like first. And so analytics, I'll get, I'll, I'll put an example here, but analytics gave a good, throughout his report, he gave screenshots of what a site will look like. So I'll, I'll suggest you go back to that, but basically it's easy to understand it from this perspective. It's a high ad density. What does that mean? <laughs> that means that MFA sites often have an excessive number of ads, sometimes overshadowing content. And so ads are everywhere. So Unless it's, if sometimes it's, it's not visually um, appealing or it's not visually, you can't really see it because sometimes most sites out there have lots of ads, but those are really extra, okay? It's like stands out. Um, they have low engagement. That means that on your report, you might see that you might, re that particular site might look like a lot of impression counts, very much a low CPM, a lot of impression counts, but maybe there's absolutely very little clicks going there or a very, 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 very suspiciously, very, very low CTR. Now, let me put a, a side note here because as a trader, um, especially for displays or I'm not talking about CTV here, but for like online video, uh, street, um, not streaming again, but uh, display ads, banners, whether it's HTML or not, um, sometimes CTRs are low. But this particular, and it shouldn't be that high also too. It shouldn't be very high, okay? So that's that. If you're running a programmatic campaign, your CTRs are like 3.0%, either as a formula or a math issue, as a math thing, or as a, you know, something is suspicious, right? But in this case of an MFA, is really, really low, almost non-existent. Um, irrelevant content. Again, when, as a trader, y'all, we don't know, like, we'll just look at the list of of domain as like one of those things we got to go through really quick we don't have time to check every single one of them i on the other hand when we perform a training with a trader a team of trader we in encourage you know click on some of these sites but you still cannot look at all ten thousands of sites that we bid on right so that's a side note so even though the MFA definition, according to the ANA, a a a Jones Media, Analytics, all of the, the four A's, the MRA, I don't know, if that's it, you know, all of those acronyms, companies thrown out there telling us what an MFA looks like, um, irrelevant content is one of them. So the content may be, uh, might be shadow, shallow, outdated, um, irrelevant, aiming solely to track clicks basically okay and so those those examples i feel like if you scroll down not sh throwing shade at meta but sometimes when you you're in the facebook marketplace and you click on some of them and it sends you to like a slideshow of things that has nothing to do sometime of on what you're clicking on um that's a good example of irrelevant content which again as a i'm gonna pin this for later but that's what forbes ww3 dot forbes.com did so we'll talk about analytics uh second report that just came out in april in a few seconds here um all right so going back to the definition so high added density low engagement irrelevant content unreliable traffic source look for unusually spikes in traffic from like dubious that's the word dubious or unknown sources uh which is very again it's very um hard to look at from a DSP standpoint, because again, the way you would look at MFA site is in your inventory report, right? So you're pulling your inventory report, you're pulling it by site list, breaking it down to that one ad group. Please don't optimize your site list, your inclusion or exclusion list at a campaign level or the advertiser level. <clears throat> 
I, I'm saying this, do not do that. Do it at the ad group level. Do it at the line item level. Because one site that's working for a contextual targeting tactic can work better than a site that is working, um, works, may work more efficiently than a site, um, than a behavioral tactic, right? Or than a retargeting tactic, or then even a different format, like streaming versus display. So it is the utmost importance that when you're optimizing and you're looking at your site list, whether you should continue including or excluding that you do it at a tactic level, the ad group level. And yes, you should not do it once in a while. You should do it regularly, <laughs> maybe daily, at least, at least weekly at this point because of everything that's happening. So that's one. History, um, that's check the domain's age and history using tools like WHOIS or domain research services. Frequent domain changes can be a red flag. I mean, again, I'm in my site list, right? Like the DSP is telling, it's giving me all those sites that I have to optimize off of. Like I ain't got time to do all of those research. Lack of organic traffic. MFA sites may have minimal organic traffic and social media presence. Use tools. <laughs> Use a tool to help you verify all of these, okay? So I've, I've taken of like, it's a large document of everything that I've been tracking over the last... <laughs> few months actually this is what i'm hearing from mfa site i mean basically word document a notepad um and so utilize those verification tools so yes it's another tool for us to track <laughs> but it's important for us to to do our job efficiently so we have to invest and and partner up with these these ad verification and we'll talk about some of those ad verification um uh, partners later on um, but obviously analytics is one of them and I am specifically commenting professionally commenting on those two reports that he brought out okay so we've kind of defined MFAs we've kind of understand how to determine based on the definition that we're that the industry is giving to us so why MFA like why now like what the heck what, why now let me just remind everyone listening or watching this that on June 19th, 2023, the ANA pulled out a report. Basically, I think that was a, a whistleblower. Isn't that what it's called? Like a whistleblower. Um, basically just calling out a lot of brands and media holding companies, uh, spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on of the ad dollar on MFA sites. And at that point, as an industry, we went back, we went on a witch hunt. And then as we always do when something happened, and then somebody, I think it was Chris Kane from Jones Media or one of one of them um, came out and said, wait, wait a minute now, we don't even know what MFAs are. How do we define it? And so he has the technology, he has the tool, he scrubs, he scrubs all of those inventory before it's, it's, um, well, he scrubs these inventory and he has a proprietary technology. So we'll have him on the podcast so he can really break it down how they uh, operate. But my understanding on how Jones Media operates is that they are looking at all of the suppliers down to the sellers, down to that site and understanding based on this definition, if it's not yes or a no, or if it, it or grading it. Right. And also I would like to point out that some of those partners do it on a consistently basis. And our mistake as traders is that we'll add those sites in our inclusion list and not go back to it to see if, yes, they've improved or not. And so I think that's a mistake. I think we should continue looking at site, excluding them and re-including them. But again, <laughs> I may be opening another can of worm for you as a trader, but just pin this idea that we, if once you're using those partners, you're able to go back in and out from this type of inventory, right? Like the market ain't saturated. We're not maximizing our bids here. We're just saying like, Give those publishers a chance, okay? So I'll get back to that particular uh, relationship with the publisher in a second here. I just want to get through the definition. So back to June 19th, and a ANA report came out, you know, blowing the whistle on those big brands, letting them know 
it's popping basically y'all y'all spending all this money and you sh- you're not saying anything now fast forwards another a bunch of uh, Another form of the research, I believe, came out that September, like an upgraded one. But now I'm moving on to the next point here is that the first report that came out from Adeletics. Um, If you have not read the report yet, uh, the, rep- uh, the report is actually on his website, is under the Adeletics, uh, what is it, Adeletics? It's adeletics.io. And then the title is, what is the title? Are Amazon and other ad tech vendors serving ANA members ads on made for arbitrage website in 2024? This one came out in January. I think that's the January report or February. Okay, earlier this year in 2024. So in 2023, summer 2023, we discovered that there is such a thing as MFA as if it was the first time we've discovered. MFA has been around for quite some time now. Um, back in September, uh, during Q4, a bunch of companies came together, like Jones Media, ANA, um, the four A's. Again, I am sorry if I'm missing one of them. There are so many of them out there. But a bunch of companies came together, met on a weekly basis, I think, or monthly basis to define made for arbit- arbitrage sites. Um, and now, six months later, right? <laughs> Christoph, he's doing his thing, you know, he's, 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 he has a proprietary, I believe his technology is compared to snowflakes technology or sits on snowflakes technology. I don't know exactly, but he's able to determine if sites or MFAs. And so the way he discovered this and the Forbes thing is that most of MFA sites don't want to be basically I'm, I'm dumbing it down here, but most of MFA sites don't want to be discovered by Google's crawlers. Right. So if you're typing in your Google, like you're typing www, that's something um, you should have like organically, you should have sites results. Right. And so that's because Google's crawlers or Google's little engines, a little wizard called crawlers goes onto every single site's on this internet, on this interweb to determine that, oh, there are websites that have these keywords, boom, okay, result, boom, 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 okay? And so MFA sites usually don't want to be found by those crawlers. That's one of the main thing, actually. It's like, why would you not want to be found by Google's crawlers so that you can be served organic organically and that organic traffic comes to your site, right? So it's very, very... It's very, very suspicious, yes. And that's why it's an MFA site is because it's only made, only paid traffic is going to that site. Only paid traffic, once you click through from another source, um, only that type of traffic can be sent to the to that page. So that's one. And so that's how Christoph and his team and his technology discovered the Forbes thing. But back to the Amazon, the first report. The biggest finding that you want to remember from this report is that the companies, <laughs> the companies, the media holding agencies, the uh, media holding companies, those big ad agencies that, you know, went on saying, how absurd, this is ridiculous, flipping tables, why are we spending all this sh- money on all these sites? The same damn companies are still spending money on these damn sites that they were flipping table for. And I, and again, I'm really recapping to down to one emotions here. When I went through the whole report, I think it was 18 page, 30 page, I don't know. When I went through this whole report, like it took it took me a few a few weeks. I'm not gonna lie, okay? Because also I have other things and I'm reading books, but it took me a few weeks to go through this data because I really wanted to understand what the heck was going on. And y'all. We're still, we still have not progress made any type of, mm, let me rephrase this. We, these companies that have cried out loud, like, you know, jumped on roof, on the rooftops of our industry to say, this is absurd. This is unacceptable. We're going to come up with something and do it on their own. They're still buying MFX. But to play devil's advocate here is that it is still, you know, because we just kind of came up with this definition, there are technologies, even though we work in a technology, <laughs> in a technology heavy um, industry, it's not as, it's, it, 
it's a little bit more complicated to actually implement, right? Um, technologies or to readjust, recalibrate the engine to make sure that now they're flagging some of that, okay? And so the biggest finding about this particular, the, the analytics findings, the biggest, here's an overview of the analytics finding for that first report is that hundreds of brands, including PNG, Bayer, Reckitt, AT&T, Johnson & Johnson, AbbVie, Novartis, Pfizer, State Farm, PwC, Heart, Hershey's, Unilever, Mondelez, Mars, Halion, Ford, NBC, Universal, ARP, Dell, U.S. Army, U.S. Air Force, Navy, Wall Street Journal, General Motors, Google Meta, Hyundai, Molson Coors. Anyway, many others have uh, continued to have their ad placed on made uh, on MFA website as of January 2024. So that's what the first report was about. These sites employ aggressive ad refreshes, raising concern about frequency capping, which I'm going to talk about in a hot second. Um, frequency capping leading to astron astron astr astronomically high prices to reach a single consumer. Uh, major agencies such as IPG, Dentsu, Omnicom, Publicis, IPG, WPP, Stagewell, Stagewell, and Horizon Media, Horizon Media, excuse me, Diligent, anyway, a bunch of them have been observed transacting major brands on MFA sites. So in June, we discovered this was a problem. Later on during that year of 2023, a bunch of these these agencies we just named out loud came up saying, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Now in January of 2024, they're still spending, not less, not more, but like they're still spending, they're still spending uh, a good amount of ad dollars on MFA sites. Okay. So that's the first thing. And so um, anyway, this, there's a lot going in. So such as any good scientific experiment, you have to do it based of a sample of a data pool. And that's what um, analytics report is talking about. And so identifying a sample of MFA website and, and what analytics did is like they conducted, conducted, excuse me, a review of website that showed or exhibited uh, behaviors consistent with the definition of MFA website. Okay. So the definition we covered earlier. These website were observed to source traffic through tabula or outbrain ads and had a large percentage of paid media traffic. They also served over 1,000 ad impression to a single consumer in a short duration page view session. Okay, that's really important. Um, Deepsea.io and John's Media confirmed. Okay, so now we have more partners to think about, uh, to think about, partnering with okay so deepsea.io and john's media confirmed that these websites were classified as mfa some of these websites modulated the number of ads served based on how the viewer arrived to the page and this allowed indexing by google and bing crawlers so remember what i i the example i told you earlier Forbes specifically, I know we're talking about the January report here, but Forbes in the Forbes case, for instance, that we'll cover in a sh shortly, <clears throat> um, um, the website disallowed indexing by Google and Bing scrollers. So like if you had to go and Google Forbes, for instance, you would never be able to get to that site at that time because it was it was not allowing the the, the crawlers to get on there. So that's like, again, why would you not want to be discovered organically? Okay, that's fundamental. So those examples include scissify.com, goreferences.com, globetip.com, and those are MFA sites that he covered in his, uh, in his re report. Okay, I also want to take a quick break here and give a shout out to this AI tool I use to help me go through some of this, these research. So I did use ChatGPT. I think I still have the free version on my computer and the paid one on my phone. I know it doesn't make sense, but anyway. <laughs> and, and what I did was literally copy pasted the whole report into uh, ChatGPT and ask it to uh, recap it. And 
Uh, oh, that's one way. So I, I read the report. I went back to with ChatGPT. I started with ChatGPT and then went back to reading from the report. And then I also used a, a tool that I think everyone in this industry should have. It's called Word Tune. And Word Tune is this little Chrome. It's a Chrome extension, y'all. I'm a Chrome girl, even though. Anyway, it's Word Tune, and um, it has different level of of service, but the the one I'm particularly at, uh, recommending, and I'll make sure to ask add this in the show notes. It is the editor version, and what the editor does is that it reads and summarize, and so it literally, if you have the extension, even if you're reading like an article on the Media Post or Ad Exchange or Digiday, um, you'll it'll literally just highlight like, oh, here's what we recap, but the. The thing that I love about WordTune and, you know, maybe ChatGPT doesn't have, or at least my version, is the fact that, okay, let's say if they recap something, um, you'll be able to read it. But then if you want to read more information, like you can click through the recap and it sends you to the part of the article that they recapped, okay? And so there's been instances, maybe two or three instances since I've been using this, this tool in the last four or five years where I've read the recap and I, and I was like, mm, something doesn't sound right. And I've gone to the article where indeed it was like, oh, I see why it was easy to, to mess up this, this, this definition or whatever. And so maybe once or twice this happens in the last four or five years, I've been using WordTune. And so it speaks volume. And in the last year that I've been using it, I have never had this happen. And I'm, I'm a reader. I read a lot. And so a quick break to let you know that if, if you want to be efficient, you have to read articles. You have to continue educating yourself on a daily basis at this point. I don't want to overwhelm you. I want you to be productive. I want you to work hard and smart. Okay. Not too hard though. Okay. And in order to be productive is to use those tools like word to recap it. And if you have to dive deeper, then obviously you have the source to go back to. So back to analytics first report. Okay. Ad tech vendors observe transacting brands on made. Okay. So, so the first report really highlighted and he called out the brands. I think he didn't call them out. They, he, he called them into the conversation. Okay. So those brands that were cited in the reports and the ad tech, he really pointed out those are the brands where their ad showed because of this. And they were served by this SSPs and this, this brand agency is this media holding company, right? So that's how, that's why we're able to know not only that it's, I don't know, Pfizer, but it was also Reckitt or it was, I mean, sorry, Reckitt is the brand, but it was IPG and it came from Pubmatic and things like that. Okay. And those are just example, by the way, <laughs> those are just example, but those three brands were mentioned in the report at some point. So another thing I would like to talk about is again, and then we've talked about so far in this in this podcast, we've we talked about MFAs as a made for arbitrage made for arbitrage site. We understand what the definition e is out here in this industry streets. Okay, we understand we got to stay street ready. We understand what a, what the definition is out here in these streets. We also understand our buyer how it all started. <laughs> this in the last two years because this this spoof sighting site spoofing goes back way before mfa became sexy to us i guess um so that's that so now we understand what it is according to the industry now we understand why we're having this conversation now we understand also the biggest the biggest thing that the first report analytics reports uh pointed out the fact that in june we talked about making a change because of this and now we still we still not there we still not there there may have been some progress i can't remember actually if that's that was a uh, in the report but the whole point of the the january report was the fact that <laughs> It is what it is, right? Um, no, I'm kidding. It is the fact that those brands are still bidding on made fun of testing. Now, before we go to the next episode, where I'll talk about the second report in particular, I'd also like to take a few minutes to talk about frequency. The frequency thing was a bit disappointing. I'm not going to lie. Okay. Um. So digital advertising has been the capacity 
the capability to frequency cap strategically. What I mean by frequency cap is putting a cap, putting a number. I only want to serve this particular ads that I have in my DSP X amount of time to this one cookie. It's not a user yet. Uh, we are speaking in terms of cookie at this point. And um, the research that Christoph at Adalytics showed us that frequency is shit. Basically, we're, uh, it's making me itch because it's like really disappointing. And the fact that it's, it's may not be potentially working. And so this particular part of the report, I'd like to highlight before we end the podcast and go to the next part, uh, the next one. He pointed out that potentially frequency capping violation and excess costs associated with serving ads to viewers on MFA website. Okay. And he, he had a quote from a, a, an, um, a, engineer i'm gonna call him an engine call her or him an engineer who explained why frequency capping limitation are or exist on mfas and non-mfas so let me break it down to you so i'm going to read the portion that he that um i'm going to read an excerpt directly from Ah, from uh, the analytics. I know I'm sighing heavy, y'all, because it's a bit disappointing, but y'all know me. I, I always have something going on. Like, I know I know how to go around it. So I'm gonna tell you too, a solution to this problem. But here's the excerpt about frequency capping. Okay, so I'm gonna read directly from this. Um, technically, the reason that it's hard to deal with frequency capping is that the architecture that is that we use on a DSP is distributed, high volume and scalable, perfect for dealing for hundreds of millions of requests per minute, but not very transactional. All of our writes and reads are asynchronous across many different service bid request handlers, which with their own local caches, as well as centralized master cache, is it cache or cache anyway, uh, which will all eventually be consistent. In the time that they are not consistent, each serv server only knows about the request that it receives and is not able to frequency or recency cap across the whole cluster for a couple of seconds. Although writes are sent to the master with frequency information about an ID to, whole, to the whole cluster is not available to clone that data in instantaneously instantaneously uh, because of its site sends a thousand requests at once to a very large DSP. It's very likely to many of those requests will be bid on without knowledge that other nodes in the cluster are also bidding. The banking industry deals with using transactional database where all data is consistent. This is not possible for the ad industry because of the large geographical reach um, therefore, slower network speeds um, and of, of campaigns and random natures of deliver of its delivery. And so this is an excerpt from uh, the study. Okay, so if you you were just if you fast forward to this point, this is how I'm going to explain it to you. So I went ahead because I reread that excerpt a few times and I was like, maybe I'm not just it's not just clicking and I'm a smart gal. Okay, but it's not clicking. And so I'll turn to my very trusted, um, well, trusted at time, but but in this situation, trusted uh, co-worker that is ChatGPT. And I told ChatGPT, okay, ChatGPT, explain the following. I copy paste it into ChatGPT, explain the following to a five-year-old. And this is the response. And I think it's genius. Here's the response from ChatGPT explaining the excerpt I just tried to read to you um, to a five-year-old. Okay, imagine you have a big toy factory with lots of workers. These workers make toys, and sometimes they need to know how many toys they've made in total. But because there are so many workers and they work real fast, sometimes they don't know exactly how many toys each other has made until a little later. That's really important to mark. Now, if a store asks for many toys at once, some workers might not know that others are also making the same toys 
it's like if one worker makes a toy car but doesn't know another worker is making the same one so they end up making too many in the banking world they have a special way to keep track of everything so they um so they always know exactly how many toys are made but in the toy factory which is like the advertising world because it's big and spread out <clears throat> it's hard to keep track of everything at once sometimes they end up making too many toys without realizing isn't that so genius <laughs> when i read this i was like oh is that so <laughs> Is that so? Now, <clears throat> here's a, a quick version of, so I did the same thing, copy pasted the, the excerpt directly from Adalytics report. And now I asked ChatGPT this question. And honestly, please do the same thing. When you're reading an article, when you're receiving a report, when you're receiving anything in this industry, ask ChatGPT to break it down. I, I believe in AI in that form where it can't help us comprehend things efficiently. So I said, Hi, ChatGPT. Rewrite the following, explaining it to a programmatic media trader with a junior level experience. And this is what it says. Here's the deal with frequency capping and why it can be tricky to manage, especially on the DSP side. You see, the, the, you see, comma, the architecture we use on a DSP is built to handle a huge amount of a huge number of requests really quickly. It's like having a super fast conveyor belt in a factory that can churn out hundreds of millions of products every minute. But here's the catch. This setup isn't great at keeping track of every single transaction in real time. When someone wants to show their ad at a certain number of time, that's what frequency capping is all about. The DSP has to juggle all these requests flying in from different directions. Each server, we call them bid request handlers, is handling its own load of requests, sort of like workers on different parts, in different parts of the factory, on, I'm sorry, sort of like workers on different parts of the factory floor. They each have their own little memory banks called local caches, where they store information temporarily, okay? Now, here's where it gets tricky. The, these servers don't always talk to each other right away. They, they might not know that another server has already dealt with a similar request. It's like if one worker on the conveyor belt doesn't realize that another worker has already packed the same toy in the box. Even though we try to keep track of how often an ad should appear, we call that frequency information, Sometimes the different parts of our DSP don't sync up instantly. So if a website sent us a ton of ad requests at all at once, there's a good chance that some of those requests will get processed separately without knowing that others are doing the same thing. Now in the banking world, they have fancy databases. <laughs> That's where it says fancy. They have fancy databases that keep everything perfectly synchronized. We call that transactional database. But for us in the ad industry, it's a bit trickier. Our campaigns can span large areas, which means information takes longer to travel between servers, takes slower network speed. Plus, ad can pop up randomly, making it even harder to keep everything in sync. So this is my, this is where I'll end this podcast. <laughs> um, the biggest thing you want to remember is that you, you have to keep you have to keep informing yourself about how the industry is move in moving. The second thing is that you're going to need a partner to help you be more efficient in the MFA hunt, right? The third is that now, um, the I guess the silver lining, the beauty of it all is that we, we're discovering that other things may not be working and therefore why it's so, 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 so much more important to look at campaign performance on a daily basis. And I hate this, set it and forget it. There's not, first of all, who sets it and forget it? If that's you, I come to you with honor and love and peace to let you know to stop doing it. Um, but honestly, like most of us don't uh, hurt Ant Ant Anthony Vargas, oh wait, Anthony Vargas, say on the Addicts, uh, on the Addicts Changer podcast last week, how, you know, that's that's why we can no longer do set and set and forget it. Yes, Anthony, we can't. We we should have never. And who who else? But 
in playing devil's advocate, most traders, adopts people that are actually DSP expert and logging in every day to doing DSP and looking at the campaign performance, uh, they ain't got the time to go back in, back in there very often or as often as they want. That's straight up. That's straight up. Unless you're working for an agency trading desk that is solely, solely his its sole role is this. It can be very tricky for a trader to make the time. And so if you're a manager of a trading team or you're leading an activation team, uh, make the time, normalize time blocking for your people and don't disrupt them during that time. Allow them to spend time in the report, in the campaign, in those site lists, right? And site is only one of the many things they have to look at. So set it and forget it is a big no-no. It was never, it was never no okay, even when AI is coming across. Now, I would say this is that if you're hearing this message, and you're realizing like, yeah, that's my team. We never have enough time to go back and optimize. Then maybe it's time for you to invest in something like Chalice Algorithm or any other optimization performance-based AI, again, like Chalice, that helps you make those decisions faster, okay? So I'll leave you with this. Next week, I'm going to cover the second report. Um, because there are still lessons to these reports. And if you have not had a chance to read it, I, I recommend the read in general. Like take your time like I did. Don't allow the industry to force you to to stay. No, I'm, I ain't gonna get bullied by this industry just because I ain't got time to read all the damn articles. But what I will make time for, what I will uh, apply pressure on is understanding conceptually and, and implementing it technically right <laughs> so have a wonderful day it was a lot of information i sometimes re-listen to podcasts i sometimes bookmark it i sometimes use chat gpt word to other chrome extension to help me di decipher things i've been working in the industry for 10 plus years there are still some concept i'm like wtf man why right and so it's okay it's absolutely okay just Make sure you take action of this. Just make sure you're able to explain it to somebody else. If you're not able to explain it to somebody else, go back and reread some of those articles I'll mention in the job description. Go back and re-listen to some of this information. Take screenshots. DM me if you need me. Hire me if you need me. I love that. Um, but definitely, it's, it's, the, uh, it's super important that we stay educated as much as possible. Okay? <laughs>